Um, Gene tells me that the, the heat has been requested and it did come on at 7 o'clock. So just uh, stay with us. <laughs> The Zoning Board of Appeals will hold a continuance of a public hearing in the Great Room at the Pleasant Street Center, 49 Pleasant Street, Reading, Mass, on Wednesday, October 24, 2018, at 7 p.m. on the petition of Lakeview, Eden Lakeview Development LLC, who seeks a comprehensive permit to develop 86 units of rental housing on 4.33 acres of land that is partially in a residential zone and partially in an industrial zone under the Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 40B, Section 20 through 23, with waivers from the zoning requirements on the property comprising six parcels uh, known as Zero Lakeview Avenue, Map 17, Lot 131, Zero Lakeview Avenue, Map 18, Lot 2, 23 through 25, Lakeview Avenue, Map 18, Lot 1, Zero Eaton Street, Map 17, Lot 274. Zero East Street, Map 17, Lot 275. And 128 Eaton Street, Map 17, Lot 276, Reading, Massachusetts. Um, since this is a <coughs> continuation of the past four hearings, um, I will go through the list of the uh, uh, butters. Um, except to say that everybody was notified again. Uh, I think we went to extreme uh, to make sure that everybody knew and uh, the neighborhood did post signs again on the meeting, so that was very helpful. And it was on the website, so I think we'll cover that. I, I was not notified, I was not previous. Yeah, previous. Yes, we, we send the notification out initially and then use the website. Yep. Uh, the agenda for this evening really is uh, around the report uh, that we received from the engineering uh, team of Nitsky. Um, get towards in a second. Uh, engineering um, um, of two center plaza suite 430 Boston Mass. Before we get started, however, in case there are people here or people listening out in the audience, I would ask uh, Andrew if he would recap what we did back on the last meeting, which was September the 5th. Andrew? So on September 5th, we again did a recap of the July 18th meeting, which real quick is when the development team presented the new plans that they again are presenting today and we're reviewing. Um, we then moved on to dedicate the meeting primarily to traffic, where both the applicant's traffic engineer, Kim Parzabadian, and Green International's Wing Wong did a peer review, um, both co-op on a presentation to the public on the traffic and any related issues trying to finalize that where we then got a lot of good feedback from the public on traffic and their issues and we've kind of decided how to move forward with a more intensive study of the area going forward with the town so that is in the works and hopefully coming soon um, but then from there, we just finalized and agreed on the scope of work for the engineering peer review, which you will hear about tonight. And the applicants will have a chance to respond to that as well. And we will confirm a new meeting date from here on out as scheduling is getting a little tight, so. Um, since that meeting, um we also had a few things mm -hmm. done. We held a DRT between staff and the applicants, which we have DRT notes posted online on the town website that you can review. And we will perhaps briefly go over them again tonight. Um, any new information from there. And again, we have the new traffic, or sorry, engineering peer review, which was also posted on the town website. So. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Gene, did you have anything? Okay. okay, I'll turn it over to uh, Matt. Um, Matt Passard, Executive Pro uh, Project Engineer. 
um, for this particular project, and he is our peer, peer review uh, individual for the engineering aspects of this project. Matt? Should I use the microphone? Should I use the microphone? Yeah, Probably not a bad idea. The button that says mute turns it on. You can take it out of that stand if you need to. Yes, I'll bring it. No, what's on? It might take a minute. It might take a minute, yeah. There we go. How's that? All right. Is that um, all right, so it actually might be better. Uh, so I'm uh, Matt Bershaw from Rich Engineering. We're the uh, civil engineering peer reviewers for the project. <laughs> we understand that the project has gone through several rounds of review with regard to other aspects of the project. And we've talked about a few traffic engineering and so um, And that the board and the guys is fairly familiar with this project in general. Um, our review really focused on um, reviewing the project in terms of general compliance with various aspects of the site plan review regulations, uh, the zoning bylaw. Although the applicant has uh, requested a waiver from that from that uh, that bylaw and associated regulations, bulk of, of those requirements in terms of the engineering aspects of the project are generally in line with standard engineering practice. So a lot of the stuff that, that you know, we looked at uh, is aligned with the zoning bylaw requirements is also focused mainly on just, just good engineering. Um, so a number of the, of the comments that I'm just going to read through our letter here real quick um, are specifically related to zoning items, as, as, uh, as I'll note. Um, a lot of the items that we picked up are probably shouldn't be uh, interpreted as deficiencies of the project in general or uh, kind of potential housekeeping matters that we identified for the applicant for their consideration and response. So uh, with that said, I guess uh, as we have done the last couple of times we've done these reviews, I'm, I'm going to step through our review comments, paraphrasing a few things, and truncating a few things, uh, but identifying all the issues and then we'll give the applicant a chance to kind of respond to those. In, in turn, and we have dialogue uh, moving forward. So, uh, first group is related to zoning compliance, parking, and access. Uh, just a general comment um, you know, with regard to the, uh, the site layout. Uh, we understand there are a couple of iterations uh, with regard to site access, access points, and uh, traffic flow. Um, we didn't really uh, look at look at the previous version too closely, but we didn't really recognize like we didn't recognize any deficiencies with this layout in terms of access to circulation, emergency vehicle movement, current rating, and things like that. Um, in terms of the zoning bylaw, uh, the parking requirements for the project, the applicant has addressed those. And, uh, for the most part, we requested a couple of waivers for a waiver. Um, there appears to be adequate parking for the townhouse. Um, townhouse area up here appears to be in compliance with exterior and interior parking for each unit. Um, visitor parking spaces and the end of the parking spot here. Um, the apartment lot here uh, according to the zoning is 111 spaces required. The applicant is uh, proposing 101 with an area of designated as future parking we'll get right there in 10 cases um, we, we bring the total number up to the uh, compliance uh, level uh, our only comment on that uh, item was that the spaces aren't actually being constructed that we recommended that the applicant formally request a waiver from the board of appeals for that item Second item related to traffic parking is that under zoning there are four loading spaces that are required for a project for the, uh, oops, sorry, for the apartment complex based on density. Uh, the project does not propose any loading or loading spaces. And they have requested a waiver for that item. We're recommending that they provide some information to the, to the board with regard to the functionality of the site, 
how you know how residents will uh, uh, unload and unload, move in, move out. Is related to the intent that is on the farm. So, you know, four spaces to zero is going to be appropriate for them to describe how those operations will work on site. Uh, so, here's an example of a relatively minor item we've called attention to. Uh, there are uh, appear to be a requisite number of handicapped parking spaces that are shown. Recommending that in addition to the striping, that appropriate regulatory signage be included in the project. Again, something that presumably when these go to construction documents they can be included, um, but it is a technical regulatory decision to be more So, in terms of the overall site engineering, our comments are broken into a couple different sections. Um, on that first section of the comment letter is related to the site grading design. By and large, the grading looks appropriate for the project. Our, our, the thrust of our comments on that topic um, are really sort of recommendations sort of for some additional information in relation to the site grade. Some additional spot grades, some clarification on slopes, recommendation for potentially increasing the contour interval. Um, plans currently have a two foot contour interval. Um, and in this, in this, in our opinion, um, a site of this, uh, this size and with this kind of topography might be more informative for the plants to use at one point. Again, not any kind of regulatory requirement, it's really just kind of a, a practice standard. Um, and comment number two under grading design is just a recommendation for some additional spot grades in various areas across the site. Along the Eaton Street frontage with the townhouse yard, there are a number of sidewalk connections that connect to the street right away. It's recommending that the applicant yeah, provide a little more clarity on, um, on creating for those to um, ensure the proper connection with the, with the sidewalk on the street frontage. Um, and just some clarity on a couple, couple areas of uh, townhouse plot where we see plot there may be the possibility for some of the flat slopes that could be clarified uh, by some additional spot Similar comments for a couple of other landscape areas that aren't. I don't know if there's any real consequence, but uh, again, just some additional information is probably appropriate. Uh, again, number three, some minor grading adjustment uh, the applicant and I discussed earlier in the day, really just a, a drafting clarification on the townhouse lot. Um, you know, some area for the curve layout has been altered to the grading adjustment. Uh, one area we noted know that the area where the future parking is located on the grading plan indicates that that site is being graded for a curved parking lot. So again, just I think it's just a graphical issue that needs to be resolved. We really didn't pick up any, any real deficiencies in terms of the design itself of the site. The next session is related to uh, utility services, uh, water service, uh, all of the um, six inch water service for uh, each building on block. A single water service connection for each one of these buildings um, that includes one connection each for both fire and domestic water service. We just recommended that the application verify that the Department of Public Works will allow that condition versus the separate water uh, systems for domestic water. That may be something that's already been discussed uh, in the town, but it's a, it's a, a common uh, item that uh, Public Works departments have regular Similarly, um, there's some system clarification we're looking for for water services that are being shown for townhouses. Each individual townhouse along Eaton Street has an individual water connection. There appear to be a shared water connection for the rear services. Just again, want some clarification where the department public work would want the actual shot valves for all those units. So again, sort of again, not a regulatory issue, but a design practice question. Like that. One question regarding hydrant coverage. There's, there's a hydrant indicated in the water service at this intersection. Uh, we recommend that the applicant 
comment on whether or not the fire department has uh, opined on whether or not that's sufficient coverage for the development. It appears to us to be the only hydrant for the development. Um, and again, this would be contingent on the regular fire department's preferences and requirements, whether or not they would need additional hydrants on the rear of this project or the rear of this site. Uh, Sanitary sewer service. Um, sewer service for the townhouses in the rear of the townhouse lot are served by a gravity service connection to a sewer pump station located here, which is intended to charge up to the gravity sewer, the new gravity sewer main in Lake Lincoln Avenue. Um, just request the, or suggested that the application be includes some additional information on the pump station. There didn't appear to be any emergency storage or emergency power uh, associated with the pump station, which would be something we would normally expect to see for a project like this. So we're just recommended the yeah, comment on that. Uh, let's see. Just some additional information we're looking for for the connection of the new gravity sewer on Lincoln Avenue where it connects to the existing sewer. The plans that we reviewed didn't appear to have uh, information related to the elevation of that existing main hall. Again, just another housekeeping item that we just thought the application should have done. We noticed that the drawing details include a sand uh, trap. Detail, we could identify without showing or requiring the project without it might be a carryover from the previous version of, of the project uh, design. If there is one included, we're just curious as to where it would be used. It's normally something that would be used for an enclosed uh, parking or for the storage area. If we can see that on the project layout, we're just going to be clarity that. Again, relatively minor, possibly going to be uh, electrical service did not appear to be shown on the pump plants, and um, normally we would expect to see uh, at least one transformer for a project of this scale, and potentially one for the townhouse development, depending on how the power distribution was, was arranged. Uh, we know any location for transformers on the site, so we thought that should be something that should be added if needed to the plants uh, because they impact the landscape. I have attention to the site layout. Uh, the next section revolves around stormwater management. Uh, by and large, uh, we reviewed the, the drainage calculations that were provided to the project. They seem to be prepared in accordance with standard procedures, design standards, uh, information related to the DP stormwater management standards seem to be in order in terms of the amount of information that was provided and the manner it was put together. We did have a couple of comments just about the, the design of the main feature of the drain system. On um, the townhouse lot, which is a fairly large infiltration field that's located here between the units. And there are two fairly good sized systems that are on the apartment building complex. Uh, without getting into the weeds of the details, uh, just one thing we noted was that it appears that when these systems are in function during, during a brainstorm event, there may be some, what's referred to as a tailwater or backwater condition in the piping networks that are connected to these empty fields. It's related to the, the elevation of the inlet piping that's coming into the system versus the overflow structure that controls the elevation. So we just are recommending that the applicant review that condition and possibly see if there was a way to ameliorate that. If people on the board are interested in details on that, we can discuss that after uh, we go back and forth. I'm not sure how much technical detail you're interested in, in hearing about that. Okay. Um, again, another sort of housekeeping informational related detail. The drones in the report didn't seem to include a graphic depiction of the subcatching areas that are associated with design of the drainage system, which is something we normally would want to review and comment on. Um, from our uh, spot checking and review of the actual calculation package, it looked to us like areas that are included in the calculations are appropriate. Um, but in order for us to definitively verify that, we would ask that, that we see a diagram of how much project area um, the engineer for the applicant is determining the 
guide each one of these systems, each one of these systems, the implementation systems and the associated packaging systems. Uh, one, one item related, to, mainly related to stormwater, also related to kind of the project in general, is that the, the town asked us to assess the feasibility or practicality for including low impact development design elements into the project. And by low impact design elements, specifically we looked at items that were related to stormwater management and some of the features that can be incorporated into the open space of the project or other parts of the project line that would um, either reduce or take the place of, of the drainage system that's been designed for the project. It's a fairly conventional standard closed pipe drainage system. We kind of typically refer to as a um, sort of gray pipe system um, as opposed to green infrastructures, gray infrastructure being most mostly structures, concrete, subsurface, stone, infiltration. So um, the basic elements of a, of a, of a site, again, without getting into weedy levels. Um, that we look at, we look, look at whether a site is, is, pro, is appropriate for, for using green infrastructure site design elements such as rain gardens, fire retention areas, uh, permeable pavements, and other items that are kind of take the place of conventional drainage infrastructure. There are a couple different parts of the site that we look at right off the bat. One is groundwater additions and the other is soil additions. So on this site in particular, based on the soils information that the applicant provided, um, there isn't a, a deep uh, depth of groundwater, but it's also not shallow. It's, I think uh, rated between, of course, I think it's between four and six feet across most of the site, um, which basically the benefit of that is it gives you the ability to, to design infiltration systems. There's uh, surface retention and infiltration systems that have a really good depth of groundwater, which allows filter needed to be uh, designed under those systems and also to maintain an offset from the groundwater field. The other um, uh, part of the site that is conducive to using those here are the fact that the soils are fairly permeable. The soil testing that was submitted indicates that most of the, the soils on the site are primarily sands and gravels uh, with relatively high permeability. Well, if there weren't were permeability tests run on the site, um, soil type that was uh, defined uh, in the soil logs is conducive with the permeable soils. So that said, both of those factors to us say that they're, you know, uh, basically the site's not precluded from the incorporation of those kinds of design um, What we did not do, what we weren't really tasked with, and the reason our, our role here would be to suggest actual locations, sizes, and types of facilities that could be incorporated here, really where they would go, how big it would be. But we did suggest that there may be some, some opportunities in, uh, in, in some in, in the sites in key areas, for example, there's some open space areas located between these townhouse units, there's an open space area here. Um, there are some isolated open areas in front of the apartment buildings, which could be uh, available, sites that could be available for a small, uh, sustainable DMP such as rain gardens. Um, fire retention areas might be possible if there were more area and larger tributary. If there are larger tributary areas available at the moment, they're kind of bigger, more complicated systems. Rain gardens are a little simpler, kind of smaller scale versions of those. Uh, and the main benefit for the site, um, for the site design by incorporation of those elements in some isolated areas would be to um, take a little bit of uh, rainwater from, from the open space, potentially from some of the roofs in the, the townhouse units, and direct it away from the closed pipe systems, put it directly into the ground. So the main benefit is increased infiltration, potentially you know, some, some scale of reduction in some of these infiltration fields. Um, again, there really, you know, based on like, the site design that's here, there really aren't any opportunities for large scale versions of those. Would be available on different types of sites. This is a little bit more of a compact site. Um, the other green infrastructure design on the things frequently on projects that would be conducive to this project in terms of its practicality, in our opinion, um, would be the use of permeable or 
porous asphalts. Porous asphalt are permeable on the site. I think that's primarily because again the soils are permeable, the groundwater is not um, too shallow. Um, the main impact of that would potentially be you know, a potentially uh, significant reduction in the scale of the of the infiltration. Again, we're not our goal here isn't to have an opinion on whether those systems should be incorporated here. Our the question to us is is it feasible or practical for their use? And I think our answer to that is yes. Um, in that so how how they would be implemented and what scale and what degree would be something we would look for the applicant to respond to and for the board to have an opinion. I correctly read the thrust of that request. I think that's um, okay, so the only the, the remaining item on our actual letter is regard to work that's being done in the flood. We're asked to look at implications of the project in terms of uh, the local uh, flood ordinance, as well as protection of regulations. In terms of the local ordinance, the project seems to be in compliance with uh, the local uh, required, locally required uh, setbacks. So a couple of setbacks that are required, uh, a site disturbance setback and a structure setback from, from the wetland line uh, that surrounds most of the project. The project appears to respect those offsets. Um, the other impact that the project has that's acknowledged on the plans is Grading thing? Yeah. Uh, there are a few areas where uh, the floodplain that surrounds this part of the project is impacted by some site grading activity. Uh, so, under the Wetland Protection Act, the applicant and the developer is required to uh, provide compensatory storage for areas that are impacted by filling portions of the floodplain. Uh, so, the plan indicates areas, areas of impact here and here. It, it, uh, designates an area of uh, potential compensatory storage volume. The materials that were submitted didn't have, um, didn't include uh, calculations that are associated with those volumes in terms of the impacts for the compensatory uh, requirements. So we're suggesting that the applicant uh, should provide those for review to uh, for us to determine whether or not the project is in compliance with that level of protection. Uh, and there were a couple of other uh, items that the town has asked us to, to take a look at that were related to items that normally would be in a, a civil engineering peer review letter. And we just call attention to um, some landscaping uh, tree comments and some lighting comments uh, that were included with the previous documentation of the board's issue. And I'll just read those real quick. Uh, on page four of four of the memo that was issued in October 3rd. Applicant will increase buffer through the new street to the new street butter and may add some pressures to the body property because the butter is minimal. Um, green street to face the increase between the project and lake apartments. And that will be used for snow storage and plant the trees if desired. Um, irrigation will be provided for grass areas and planting. Paying all the proposed that the site with, with a new Woodstock Bay fence wall in the property, property line, and that the applicant was encouraged to maintain as many trees as possible, especially those that provide screens or waters and that screen uh, storage and paying wall from the site. So, again, we didn't specifically uh, review the documents in terms of compliance with those items, but we just are asking on behalf of the board and the applicant to provide a comment and response to how they address those. Uh, similarly, um, we did look at um, the photometric plan that was included with the project materials. It's related to the lighting comments that were, that were included in the memorandum. Uh, comment uh, refers to Paul Mountain Square with LEDs that proposed the parking lot. Uh, this original plan shows some spillover back in the building, but zero spillover at property lines, which is typical um, and what would be expected for a project like this. Um, there was some additional discussion uh, with regard to whether or not the, the lights would be adjustable after, after installation to fine tune their effect, their perceived effect on the light properties. Uh, so we would ask that the applicant yeah, respond to that. So that is uh, basically the extent of our comments. 
So we get the, the discussion of the board. Do you have any questions for me before the applicant responds to those? Be happy to answer those. Or if you just want to go into the Q and A, that's no, nothing. I'd, I'd like to hear uh, the applicant's responses first. Yeah, on this uh, before I comment on it. Sorry, I, I would like to hear the response. Yep. Eric, nothing right now. Nothing. Uh, I have several way for the um, applicant right. to um, look and respond to the peer, peer engineering report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, the director, uh, Chris Sparabis, uh, said we're the mayor for the project. Uh, the engineering office of Williams and Sparabis and Milton. Uh, so we just received uh, this comment letter uh, just the other day, so we haven't had a chance to uh, look into uh, and start uh, providing responses uh, in writing, if you will. Uh, some of the uh, comments are going to require us to provide some additional information on the plans and uh, in narrative form. Uh, but I'll just go through real quick. Uh, and just uh, quickly going over the particular um, uh, the major headings. So starting with zoning compliance, parking, and access, uh, we'll make sure that we include another waiver uh, for the, uh, the potential future parking spaces. That's not going to be involved. Uh, and we've uh, expressed uh, to uh, staff members uh, most recently at the BRG meeting and our, at our last CGA hearing regarding off-street loading and unloading spaces. Um, some of the discussion that we had, you may remember the uh, overflow for the potential future parking spaces here at 10. That was going to be our uh, sort of dedicated location for um, uh, for off-street uh, parking uh, for loading. So if those parking spaces, if we anticipate those parking spaces were going to be constructed, uh, that was going to be a convenient spot for, uh, let's say, a, a loading truck to pull in here. Uh, but the neighbors, uh, together with uh, the staff, uh, uh, we heard a comment uh, regarding uh, creating some additional greenscape, and so so that's been eliminated. And so instead, uh, what we said we would provide is a, is a loading uh, plan uh, or an operation plan, how uh, the applicant uh, will be managing the special the apartment site, if you will, know, how that uh, uh, management process is going to happen with loading and unloading, uh, and we'll provide a detailed plan in writing uh, that will respond to that. Uh, adding the handicap signage uh, to comply with the, with the architectural access board requirements, uh, that, that's not a problem. Uh, we'll certainly uh, add that in. Obviously, we, uh, we show proposed striping for, uh, for handicap accessible parking spaces. Um, so that's, that's the zoning compliance section. Uh, and then grading uh, design. Uh, as Matt mentioned, our uh, proposed grading plan and our existing conditions grading plan show uh, contour intervals, which is, uh, helps you identify the shape of the land uh, at two intervals. Uh, there are some sections of the site that are relatively flat, and um, uh, that's not a problem that is adding uh, more detail, uh, which would include adding one foot contours and or spot elevations uh, to be able to prove that we don't have any flat spots or places where there might be ponding, that sort of thing. Uh, we've worked it, worked it out on paper. Um, we normally don't show uh, that level of detail because it tends to clutter up the plan. Uh, but we can certainly uh, add enough information to be able to, um, to answer the questions that were asked. That's the, uh, the grading section. Uh, and then specifically, uh, that over, uh, I keep calling it the overflow parking, but the future parking area here, we had graded that out assuming it was going to be paved. Uh, and of course, it won't be paved. So we can easily revise that grading um, so that it doesn't, that doesn't show grading associated with curving. Uh, so we can definitely uh, update that on the plan. Under utility services, uh, so the most important part there uh, under water service is uh, fire safety. Uh, as I recall, we've already uh, set down uh, uh, with the chief uh, and review hydro placement, fire department connections. Uh, and because the site is going to be, um, it's going to contain buildings that for the most part are going to be sprinkled, uh, especially the larger buildings, the 12 unit buildings out front here, and the larger building out back, and our four unit buildings, 
uh, but she felt that existing hydrant at the end of uh, the intersection of Lakeview and Eaton would be enough uh, because uh, the rest of the building is going to have fire department protections and he's um, asked us to place them in specific locations. So for example, on the 12 unit buildings, we're going to have a uh, chief request that we have our fire department connections on the outside of the buildings uh, so that a fire truck could easily pull down the driveway here and have a fire department connection access here. Similarly over here, and then for other building, the fire department connection will be in the back, so a fire truck can come uh, and access um, a fire department connection off the back. The water services and the configuration of the water services, uh, you may recall that um, uh, you can see these black areas here. These represent where we're teeing off of the existing water main and coming in to this building, to this building, uh, and then over to this building. Uh, the particular configuration that we have, um, uh, so it's not that pipe area, we have one main pipe coming in, and as we approach the building, we tee off of it with our domestic connection. Uh, but we can certainly sit down with the DW and just confirm that configuration with them. Uh, it's a similar uh, condition across the street where we have individual water services uh, for the homes here. Uh, but again, uh, to minimize the amount of piping, we're running, we're proposing to run one pipe that comes across the front of these buildings where each of the buildings can tie in. Obviously, the building is going to need their own uh, water shutoff. Uh, and we can uh, coordinate um, that exact configuration of the DBW to make sure that, um, that it complies with their, uh, with their requirements here in town. Regarding uh, the sanitary sewer service, uh, we are proposing a, a small pumping station to serve uh, uh, the back units here. And we can certainly provide some additional detail uh, for that pumping station. Uh, normally, the way uh, we design them, uh, it's either um, uh, the station needs to provide 24 hours of emergency storage or backup power. Uh, so it has to be either or. The detailed design hasn't been done yet. We normally don't do that until a little bit later uh, in the process. Um, as you know, the, the project has gone through many iterations, and so updating a detailed sewer pumping station design every time um, as a, it can be a, can add a, that cost can add up. But we can, I, I guess at this point, we, I hope we feel confident that uh, the plan is going to be changing hopefully too much um, going forward, so we can go ahead and finalize that uh, pumping station design at this point. A sanitary sewer connection out on Lakeview Avenue. Uh, so in my uh, in a previous presentation, um, we had uh, we presented to the board that the existing sewer main ends right about here. And so that uh, sewer manhole is the one that we're uh, proposing to connect to and extend uh, the sewer uh, across the edge of the property in order for us to tie our new services in. Uh, now, we have an existing conditions plan, a proposed conditions plan, utilities plan, topographic plan. Uh, it's possible that might have missed it on the, uh, on the existing conditions plan, but on the utility plan, we do have that invert listed um, for, the, uh, for the sewer connection there. Uh, that's something that we have to pop the structure and measure down and make sure that, that we can do what we say we're going to do. Uh, but we can um, make sure to point, to point that out so that it's on the record. So still under uh, sewer. Um, uh, Matt mentioned on one of our detail sheets we did have an uh, FEC gas trap, uh, which is a typical um, a structure that's installed. Uh, if you're going to have a, a structured parking area that's going to be connected, uh, that's going to have, have drainage under the building. If you recall in a previous design, uh, these buildings across the street here had structured parking underneath. Uh, that's been eliminated, and so we don't need the gas trap anymore. So we're going to put that into the plan. So electric service. Uh, as of our last uh, DRT meeting, uh, we do need to sit down with Reading, uh, the Reading Municipal Light Department. Uh, again, that's one of those items that we usually wait until a little bit uh, closer to the end of the project, uh, but we can definitely reach out to them and, uh, and find out uh, for a project like this what the uh, reasonable expectation will be for uh, transformer locations uh, if, uh, if any are needed. Uh, we do know that there's a uh, there's, there's major uh, overhead power line, three-phase power available to us that comes uh, right down uh, Lakeview Avenue and continues out uh, beyond here. Uh, so we know we have adequate power, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll work with Reading Municipal Light to figure out exactly uh, what those transformer locations are going to end up. Stormwater management. 
uh, let's talk about uh, the first comment uh, had to do with um, our approach to the uh, hydraulic calculations for the underground penetration chambers. And we have uh, two for this site uh, and one over here. So it, it's a balancing act as far as how to set our the elevations of our pipes that lead to these structures, placement of the structures, selection of what shape structure, uh, and then uh, making sure that we maintain a certain separation from the bottom of the chamber to the estimated seasonal high groundwater table. Uh, and so um, uh, normally, uh, when we have pipes flowing into these structures, uh, we have set up um, a little bit higher as we come in. Uh, but we're battling uh, groundwater to shape the chambers and depth, depth to the top of our pipes. Uh, we're going to take a look and see if we can maybe raise those pipes a little bit uh, so that we don't have that tailwater condition. Uh, sometimes tailwater conditions uh, exist. Modeling uh, shows that um, uh, that it works. Um, it's not something that we normally uh, normally would do, uh, but uh, but it does work and it, it does happen in, uh, in certain conditions. So we can see if we can uh, take a closer look and try to eliminate that effect. Uh, the watershed maps. Uh, we definitely did watershed maps, and maybe they just didn't get uh, forwarded uh, over the map that we have our, in our stormwater report. We do have a detailed uh, watershed map that shows the uh, how we carved up the site into the various uh, sub-watersheds uh, that show uh, what sections of the site flow to which catch basins and that sort of thing. So we can uh, we'll make sure that those uh, those get over to the map as part of uh, our responding. Uh, so there was a quite a bit of discussion on low impact development techniques. And uh, during our, uh, one of our previous presentations, uh, uh, we're not, uh, our office is shy to recommend uh, them to our clients. In some cases, they can be uh, more expensive uh, options. Uh, sometimes they can get a site better. Uh, in some cases, they can save the client money. And uh, we have used them uh, on recent projects, including uh, a small subdivision uh, that we're working on in uh, Middleton. Uh, we, also designed uh, forest pavement projects uh, for some clients in particular situations. Uh, we took a more conventional approach uh, to the stormwater management design in this case. Uh, the design uh, complies with um, stormwater management regulations and stormwater management standards. Uh, but we also recognize uh, uh, that uh, staff, both planning and conservation, have asked us to look and see if we can incorporate some LID components uh, and so we, we have been talking about it uh, since the last day of our team meeting with our team. And um, now with Matt's letter, uh, we'll try to identify um, an area uh, somewhere on site, um, maybe in one of the landscape uh, areas in the courtyard area where we can incorporate uh, something um, uh, along the lines of what Matt described possibly as a small rain garden. Finally, we do have uh, an area on the plan where we proposed uh, some filling of the, uh, the floodplain that's uh, directly adjacent to the site. And so uh, the floodplain is something that uh, uh, that's uh, a wetland resource area. And in our filing for the Conservation Commission, uh, we have to prove uh, to the Conservation Engineering calculations uh, that we're providing at least uh, equal compensation area uh, in the same area where the water would rise. Obviously, in this case, it rises from the adjacent uh, wetland waters. And uh, we have calculated uh, those numbers, but we have, didn't submit them to the Zoning Board of Appeals because that, that's going to be part of our filing with the Conservation Commission. Those calculations have been performed, and uh, we're more than happy to, to share them with, uh, with Matt so that he can review them. I think that, that kind of uh, covers it. Uh, again, I, I haven't got a, a chance to delve into all of the details, uh, but um, uh, I haven't seen anything uh, in the review uh, that we won't be able to, um, uh, to you know, have answers for uh, from, from that uh, you know, subsequent uh, response to us. Uh, so that concludes my uh, comments, Mr. Uh, Chair. Uh, I, of course, are here to answer questions. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> we'll start again, Bob. Uh, sure, I'll, uh, I'll try to go through with the same order here and uh, uh, on this. I was uh, glad to hear that uh, now you're uh, uh, regarding a, uh, uh, loading an operations plan there in that uh, area in front where uh, you were proposing uh, future parking if needed. 
in that. And I, I think, you know, this is something that we've discussed all along, that we need a, a loading area uh, for these uh, units here. And obviously it, it's great for those two front units. Uh, I would suspect you're going to have uh, some type of walkway or something that you would be able to get to the larger building there. Uh, the, uh, not the, you know, you have the two 12 units in front and loading uh, is right beside them if, if that's where it's going to go. And then you have the larger building in the back which in fact may entail more activity than the front two buildings in regards to uh, moving and loading, etc. So uh, I would be interested to see that plan as, as soon as you can work something out uh, on that. And uh, I know it was meant to, mentioned by uh, Mitch that uh, you know, a signage plan would be helpful. I don't know if you need a separate signage plan, but I think you do need to show signage on one of your plans there, one of the civil plans, whether it's site or or whatever general plan of the area. I think you need some signage in there in regards to traffic, in regards to handicap uh, spaces, uh, things such as that. Uh, let's see what else. And uh, I know I was, I was concerned and like uh, uh, the peer review uh, mentioned the uh, water services for the buildings in regards to fire department. But I know you sat down and there's been uh, design review team meetings with the fire department involved. So I would suspect at some point, or I would expect at some point, we're going to get a letter from the fire department uh, given their uh, okay to the project that they are satisfied with uh, everything in regards to their needs. Uh, yeah. uh, Chief Burns asked us to follow up with him, so as soon as, as, soon as the, uh, that plan is revised, yeah, it's going to get back in front of the Chief, and uh, he's agreed that we let you guys know what he thinks of it. Sure, sure. Uh, let's see. Uh, in, uh, you mentioned that the uh, uh, electric services, electric plan layout for the area is usually uh, uh, accounted for at a later date here, but I think we do need something here prior to our uh, uh, voting on this in regards to a comprehensive permit. Uh, past projects that we've done in Reading for RDBs, uh, it, it always seems that the electrical services and transformer locations, etc., turn into a, 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 a point of contention between the uh, developer or between the applicant and the town or us as a board on that. So I, I think we do need to have you sit down with our MLD and uh, at least come up with a, a first run at this, a, a first pass at where you're going to locate transformers, where electric services are going to be, etc. And we'll let them be aware of it. Uh, another one uh, issue here, and I know you've got, you've got a uh, a, a system of storm drainage throughout your site here uh, and uh, I would uh, suspect we're going to get a uh, or expect that we're going to get a letter from uh, town engineer at some point saying that he approves the layouts and accepts everything and I, I would just want to make note that I would expect that we would have a and I think we've required it of other projects and operations and maintenance uh, report you might say or explanation of cleaning of these systems such as the parking lots uh, sweeping of sand in the spring from uh, winter operations cleaning of catch basins uh, things such as that the town tries to do it on their own their own municipal catch basins on an annual basis and I would expect you know the uh, project site would want to clean the private catch basins uh, on a same thing on an annual basis and would like to see a a, a report on that, you might say. Sure, that's one of the that's one of the not of the ten standards. Uh, so in, right. our, in our stormwater report, uh, uh, I believe it's standard uh, number eight or nine. Uh, there's a detailed operational maintenance plan that describes uh, the frequency of cleaning of those structures and that sort of thing. So that's in our uh, stormwater report. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to re reiterate that. Uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it uh, from what I hear, John, and you guys' okay. comments. Uh, Sorry. Well, I don't. <coughs> Listening to both the 
your presenter and you fellows response i don't see anything in this review that constitutes a serious issue that we're going to have trouble dealing with okay it sounds to me like everything that's been presented and talked about in review i won't say has an easy solution to each one of them but has not a they're not complicated problems to solve in my opinion okay uh, what we do need is various departments of the town involved in the pieces of this thing to, to give us their blessing and frankly i don't think there's going to be any serious issue there either uh, you know i think this has been pretty well covered i don't think i need to go through the detail piece by piece like bob did but uh, i think uh, i think this is easily solvable eric uh, well, the only comment that I had is uh, just picking up on what Bob had mentioned. Is I'm sorry, Eric. Oh, sorry. Yeah, speak at the microphone oh, so everyone can hear. Yes, thank you. Uh, so the only issue that um, that I wanted to just maybe see addressed for the next meeting, just to pick up where um, a point that Bob had made, was the operating manual for the you know the trash removal, snow removal, um, the loading plan if you're going to do that in lieu of the loading zone. I saw some town comments about incorporating, you know, a Lyft, Uber, taxi, pickup. So I think that the macro elements are, are definitely coming into focus. And now that we're getting closer towards February, if we can start fine tuning it, I think that would be a good goal uh, maybe for the next meeting, maybe to have a draft of that, just so that we can kind of, I guess, get into the, uh, the, the final details of the project just so that we can kind of push this along. That's the only thing I have to say. I just had a few comments and uh, questions. Um, I'm, one, I'm looking forward to the uh, loading plan. Um, I'm optimistic that in lieu of actually having a loading space, there's a good plan that can show how people can move in and out and not interfere with the um, flow. I'd like to see that. I'm hoping to see that at the next meeting. Um, you mentioned the pumping station. You were uh, concerned that the design might change again, and your concern um, was about the type of emergency system being one uh, 24 hour storage or backup. What are the next steps on that? Now, that's my question. What do you need to know, and who decides whether it goes to storage versus a 24 hour system? So normally on a sewer pump insulation design, uh, we are guided by uh, the flows uh, that we calculate for the uh, proposed uses. In this case, you know, residential dwelling, so we'll calculate what the sewage flow is based on um, accepted state criteria. That will tell us how big um, of, of a daily flow we have. And then we uh, design our uh, pumping station such that if the power were to go out, we can either provide 24 hours of storage or a way uh, to have emergency backup power uh, should the power uh, go out. Uh, so that varies from town to town. Uh, sometimes just a, it's personal preference. Uh, the regulations tell us that it's either or, uh, so that there's a, a safeguard in place. Uh, so I believe that in this case, uh, uh, our plan is to, uh, is to do a 24 hour emergency storage for those units. It's not a lot of uh, flow. Uh, we can easily accommodate it on site, so that's going to be our approach. In the pump station, uh, there's an alarm system. Uh, there are on and off floats, if you will, and then a high level alarm. Um, so if there's a pump failure, that sort of thing. Uh, there's a, it gives the residents a, a clue that there's a problem. Uh, so the, uh, the pump station will also have a control panel. Uh, it'll be installed uh, with alarms that are audible and visual uh, to let folks know that there might be a problem with the pump station. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, the pipe that leaves the, uh, the pump chamber is a smaller diameter pipe. Uh, so water is forced uh, through that pipe uh, with the pump. And then it uh, discharges uh, you know, to the end of the gravity system where the, the, the man will go away. Uh, this sort of thing is reviewed by a uh, town engineer. Uh, so something like this would be reviewed by Ryan. Uh, uh, just like he reviewed uh, uh, the one that we designed uh, for uh, the small subdivision that we um, uh, that we recently got approved uh, on Route 28 near the North Reading Town Line. It's usually handled in house. Um, uh, so we knew that we had to design it. We wanted to get to a point where we it wasn't really going to change anymore before we did the final design. So one more question. Yeah. 
I also um, would like to see, given the staff recommendation and the Comic-Con recommendation, to see some low impact design. And my question for that was, given the concern about, um, I believe what you call it, tail watering, would a rain garden actually reduce some of that effect? So uh, the underground uh, infiltration chambers that we've designed on the project <coughs> primarily collect uh, the runoff from, uh, it really, they're designed to do uh, a few things, uh, but they're, they're mostly connected to the, the catchment, the sediment trap, the sediment separators, uh, and it collects the runoff from, you know, from all of our hardscape. Uh, it's hard, it'll be, it's going to be hard to, uh, to insert, it's going to be hard to, it's going to be hard to insert uh, a rain garden feature uh, at a point where it's after the water hits the pavement. And so the only opportunity for using, um, uh, let's say, a rain garden type feature is going to be uh, further uphill uh, or in a landscaping area, uh, either over in this area or on the townhouse projects, uh, there was an area here or here. On this side, we might have an opportunity to direct uh, uh, a roof drain to it, uh, but these areas are uh, relatively small. And um, just based on my personal experience, uh, I don't I don't see them having a, a huge effect on, on the size of these guys uh, because what's driving the size of these guys primarily is all the pervious services, which includes the roof area and the pavement uh, on both sides. But we'll, we're going to look at it and we can, we can try to incorporate something. And I don't think using I don't think the rain guards are going to have an effect on that tailwater condition. Yes, thank you, Matt. I guess I, um, I'm somewhat disappointed um, and a little concerned starting at the top. Um, just with the number of parking spaces that we have on Lot B. Uh, in the 40 Bs that we have um, passed before, there's always been um, and how contentious it was before in some of the other 40 Bs that we've done, there's always been 104, uh, I'm sorry, <clears throat> there's always been 1.5 parking spaces per unit, especially on rental units. Uh, and here we only have 101, plus the green area, um, which we take the other 10 and put the other 10 there. Uh, my concern is that when we first started out with this project, we were going to have uh, the 86 units, uh, the, the total of the 86 units, and if you subtract the 20, the 12 on the lot B, uh, that was going to be a um, an area which would accommodate a convention area for the applicants, of the uh, residents of, of the apartment complex, which then went down to a green space. And from the green space now, the only way we're going to get the uh, 1.5 parking spaces per uh, unit on that lot A is to take the green space away. So, th th to me, that's that's a major concern. Um, I think the town has always forced the bylaw on all the 40 Bs we went with. Uh, we did not accept waivers in the past. So I don't know where this leaves us. I'll just leave it there. The other concern I have is for the loading zone. We don't have any loading zone for the um, condominiums. Not that we couldn't easily make one uh, because of its location and the size of the lot. But I am very concerned about where the loading zone would be, uh, where the bylaw indicates we should have four and the applicant is only asking for zero. That means um, a complete waiver of the non of the loading zone. Uh, in talking to some in other individuals on staff, um, if a loading zone as it was down in the previous 40B were used at the entrance to one of the driveways, um, there might be, could be, uh, problems if there is a loading truck or a furniture truck or a moving truck unloading um, 
people moving in and out on the 74 units there um, to enter and exit emergency vehicles. So I think, again, in the past, we have always wanted a, a minimum of one loading zone, especially for the apartment area. I'm disappointed that we don't have anything there for them. And it concerns me to no end. But I'll leave that for us. Um, in terms of the grading design, I leave that up more to the conservation and the engineering department because they have a much better idea and feeling for that. Um, utility service, I, I am concerned a little bit about that um, only because uh, there appears to be one six inch pipe uh, for both domestic and fire suppression. And uh, I think I read someplace that there was a valve involved in that to sh be able to shut off the domestic. However, the fire suppression would never be shut off. So my question is, how, how are we going to address that? Um, the water service, I leave it up to the our own engineering department, our staff engineers, to decide if the 16 pipe is sufficient for both sites. I have no idea. Uh, sanitary services, I again, I'm just reading you the list that I have. Um, the sanitary services, I think again, it really is up to the engineering department um, and the recommendations that were brought forth by our peer engineer as to if that is satisfactory or not. Uh, stormwater management, very much likewise. I do have a problem like the other board members on the electrical. Uh, we seem to have uh, a problem in the last 340Bs, I'm sorry, last 240Bs plus this one, in locating where that electrical service is going to be. It's been moved so many times and it's slowed down to a crawl in one of the one of them just locating it with uh, the Reading Municipal Light Department. Uh, certainly when this gets started I wouldn't like to see that happen and also the board requires a final set of plans for us to stamp and move forward on this conceptual design quote unquote 40B. So we need to be getting closer to that um, and I hate to say this, but we're running out of daylight. Uh, if we want to continue meeting and get this done before the 24th of February of 2019, um, we have the possibility of only one more meeting in 2018 because of the holidays town meeting and everything and budget and everything else that's coming up. So. Again, I'm concerned that we're we're not we're not looking at the clock. We're not looking at the calendar. And if we're going to complete this on time, we need to do something to get some of these plans that are still conceptual down on paper. So those are my concerns uh, right now. Uh, and there's some other concerns that we haven't even addressed yet that are still need to be taken care of. And that's what my real concern is today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ted Regnante, uh, attorney for the applicant. I'd like to respond from a global point of view and moving forward how, how we should address these, these concerns. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Matt for his very helpful and constructive uh, comments. His uh, analysis will definitely assist uh, Chris in finalizing the plan. So my suggestion uh, would be that Chris go ahead in the next few weeks, uh, have contact with Matt, address all of the concerns that uh, Matt has raised, and come up with a revised uh, set of plans uh, for match review uh, and 
the answers to the questions that Matt has posed. And hopefully, the two of them will be able to reach an accommodation so that when we come before you at the next meeting, uh, hopefully we'll have a plan that addresses uh, all of those concerns. Uh, with regard to, uh, I don't know whether you've seen it, but uh, a very definitive list was prepared by Andrew as a result of the DRT meeting in which yeah. all of the local uh, boards, commissions, and officers having jurisdiction had comments on the plans. My, uh, my suggestion there would be to do the same thing. That is for Chris uh, and for our architect and whoever else is necessary to respond to each and every one of those to have those changes incorporated uh, into Chris's revised plans, get them to Andrew so that they can then be distributed uh, to the various boards and commissions that have the comments. Uh, and we would have that before the next meeting, which hopefully would take place in, uh, perhaps in early December. So if we could do that, then I think we have a plan the board's consideration uh, where the, the board can be either happy or not happy or make whatever suggestions for additional changes, but at least you'll have something definitive in which the peer review issues will be addressed and the issues raised uh, uh, locally by your various boards and commissions. And I think if we do that, uh, we'll be okay time-wise uh, you know, to move forward. We may have to have, uh, you know, a couple of meetings in January, to, you know, to finalize uh, that That's my suggestion. Uh, the other thing is, in terms of the actual construction detail, uh, and I'm sure Chris can speak to this issue, but uh, what we do, or what I've done in many of the 40Bs that I've worked on, is that we require, before you can pull a building permit, that final construction plans be submitted to the board, uh, and then the board would seek input from the various people having jurisdiction in the town, and those issues would be addressed in the final plans prior to any uh, building permit application uh, being made. That, that's what I suggest there. It would appear to me in listening tonight that the two major issues are addressing the concerns about home impact design and what we can do about that. The second one having to do what concern, Mr. Chairman, about, about the parking. And the third, of course, the loading. I think what I'm getting at, those are the three major substantive items that we, we need to zero in on. And uh, the tension there is that when we agreed, when we met with uh, Adriana and Adriana, Oriana and uh, her group, um, they had requested some green space, and that's why we had kind of land banked that area to have it for green space, paying respect to their, to their concerns. Now, maybe in going back to the board engineering wise, we can come up with something. Uh, that addresses both, that it leaves some green space in there uh, and per, uh, perhaps uh, addresses the traffic and loading zone. I'll leave that up to Chris if we can do that because we'd like to pay respect uh, to Boriana's uh, and her group's comments on that. Uh, and then the other thing would, would be the parking and, and see what we can do about reaching that goal of one and a half. And frankly, Mr. Chairman, I agree with you. That's that's the goal that we have in, in most what he be in, I would say, 90% of the what he be's, uh, throughout the Commonwealth. So I, I can understand that. I mean, I think the parking, which is uh, two spaces per unit for the for the ownership units, is, is, is fine to address that. But I, I see your concern. So that's uh, my suggestion to uh, how we would go about addressing these issues. I don't know whether she wants to add something about that. Yeah, if I could just add a couple of comments. Um, thank you all, that was um, very helpful to 
walk through the comments from the board, from the consultants, from the applicant. Um, I just want to emphasize a couple of key points going forward. Um, Ted, your point of having a final review of the final plans with staff, we will also be requiring what we call a code review before a building permit is issued. And we work uh, very closely with a team of experts in building, in uh, fire, fire suppression, uh, fire codes, uh, in uh, engineering and building, very specific uh, experts in these fields in, the, in an energy reviewer. So the energy code, oh, and the handicap code. So these are all very expert people in these particular fields that we have reviewed the plans. We've done it on every 40B and every 40R. Um, and so that gives the town an extra protection that, for example, one of the comments in the DRT had to do with should we be requiring two elevators. And um, the handicap code will speak to that. Uh, most definitely. Uh, the building code review will speak to that. So even if we get to the end and it shakes out one way or the other on one elevator or two elevators, we'll have another chance to have experts look at these plans and tell us what the code requires. So we've got it 100% right. Uh, and the codes are so elaborate now in all these areas that we want to make very sure that these plans meet all of those requirements long before a building permit is issued. So that's the part that um, I spent a lot of time getting involved in prior to when a building permit is issued. And I just want everyone to understand that there's that extra measure of review. Um, not to diminish what's going on here by any means. Uh, this is critical and, and I think the questions are so important to get at this early stage. Um, the second comment I wanted to make was about the calendar. I know we're all getting a little nervous about time because we get closer to this February 24th date. Um, as you can tell, since we've had to have the meeting here at the Pleasant Street Center, the town is enormously overscheduled for space and staff is enormously overscheduled for meetings in November, December, January and February. So uh, my suggestion is that if we can come up with some dates and make it as simple as possible for everybody, for, for the public that may want to attend, uh, to get a meeting room is no easy task. Um, having meetings back and forth in different locations is confusing to the public. Um, uh, did anyone go to the library by mistake tonight? I hope we I hope we didn't have that happen. Okay, good. We did put notices up the library in case anybody was concerned that it would be confusing and the librarians were aware. But having it back and forth is, is, is not ideal. We do the best we can. Um, but those are the comments I wanted to share tonight. And I'll turn it back to her um, how we're going to go forward here. Thank you, Jean. Um, did you have any? Did you have anything uh, else to say, Ted, or, or did uh, Chris want to? Okay. Well, at this point uh, on the agenda, we don't open it up to public comment. I would ask again uh, if you would take the mic, uh, introduce yourself uh, and your address, and then keep the comments short so we can get around to everybody. And um, I'll go. The mic. I'll go to Boriana first, and she's. I'll get the mic first. Mm -hmm. okay. Hi, this is Boyan the 94 Eaton Street. So first I want to acknowledge uh, what Ted said. So um, the team has been great working with us and making this project better for the neighborhood. And I just, again, want to give credit to the team. We started somewhere and we went to a somewhat better place. So what I want to comment down is actually the green space and the parking area. And when they, uh, if you count the 10 bank spaces, they are at the 1.5 ratio. So they, uh, so we discussed that for a while. We, we thought that if they build the 10 spaces, 
If you look at that plan, there's so much asphalt, big buildings, lots of impermeable area, and especially like if you look at it from the neighbor, it just like big urban space, which we felt it was not appropriate for having it just next to the protected wetlands. So typically in this kind of development, that's what we're told by uh, people who work in the area, you don't often do not need the whole 1.5 uh, ratio. Often, like uh, for practical reasons these days, people share cars, use other forms of transportation. So we agree uh, that maybe they can kind of bank it and see if there is need. If need arises, they can use it. So like formally, they have the opportunity to meet the requirement and they bank the spaces. So I would really request the board to take into account that having large impermeable areas will not produce the best development for the neighborhood. We, we kind of feel strongly about it and we feel that a pocket park in front would greatly enhance the development. It would make it work better for, for the neighborhood. I understand their bylaws and their requirements, and, but after all, this is 40B and lots of bylaws. So I do hope you consider that it's coming from us, it's not coming from them. It, it is our request to make this a little bit more green than it was originally proposed with the huge parking spaces. Like, the reason there is so much parking is because we requested that the height is lowered of the buildings because they had to do gradings to do underground parking and we were ending up with uh, buildings which were five stories high, which were actually probably taller than the retaining wall for the home depot. So uh, they were really considerate and lowered the height so it won't be really imposing uh, on the street, on the neighborhood, and we appreciate that. But as a result, they need more surface parking. And then we, you have this contention like green space versus asphalt. And we felt that we reached some compromise that they would bank it and use it judiciously. So I really asked the board if you could consider to also show some flexibility and allow them to um, preserve some of the green space uh, instead of making this like a, like a big area of asphalt. So that's uh, one common. So the, the second thing I wanted to say, you, you've seen our presentation and we feel very strongly about uh, low impact development and we would like to see it as far as it makes sense and we're happy this came up again. And uh, we do would, would like to see a more modern green approach even though we're convinced that the cluster like the more classic, like gray approach would work, and we're sure Chris has done a great job in his calculation. But we would welcome something which is more environmentally friendly, again, because it abuts the wetlands. And we'd like to see, uh, even if it's small area, so if this uh, kind of makes it a more forward-looking development, uh, that would be great. And last. I have a question, it's not my question, but uh, a person from my um, neighborhood email group has a question for the peer review. Um, so, so he starts by saying that you know, uh, your firm has a very good reputation, so I want to be assured the neighbors that we are in good hands. So that's uh, his first comment. So the next comment is he, he, would, uh, he would like if you could comment on any risk uh, of input input in storm water uh, through the fuel material which underlies the site. So he's talking about environmental risk, like ecological risk. If you could kind of uh, speak to it. Thank you. So the question is, uh, he's any, asking about any risks. If you, if risks. you can comment on risk for infiltrating storm water through the fields. Okay. The question is, is is there a risk of infiltrating storm water through the, the system? No, for the fill, the material. Oh, for the fill, the fill from the uh, what you know, is that? Like, uh, like it's industrial fill. Uh, You're talking about the site up above with George's furniture? No, no, no. On the side. On the side. Oh, okay. Well, it's because there is, I believe, uh, asphalt and uh, so on. Okay. Um, there was uh, some film material that was indicated in the, the uh, test pit 
data that was provided to the project, I believe, and Chris could probably comment on this one in detail. The infiltration systems that you see in here, um, below that material, I or they probably discharge the, the natural parent soil. However, that said, I don't believe there's any indication of, on, on this side of any kind of hazardous material in the fill overburden of the natural parent. Is that correct? That, that is correct. That's my understanding. Uh, the, uh, the applicant uh, you know, has commissioned a, a, a 21 unit assess, uh, site assessment, and uh, it has indicated that, uh, that there are any uh, issues related to, um, to hazardous waste and contamination on the site. Just to add to that, so uh, uh, you know, if there's a situation on, on a site like this, and, and which is frequent in, in all previously. Um, you know, urbanized areas that may have had some industrial activity, et cetera. You do frequently find that there are uh, pockets of material or areas of material that don't necessarily qualify as hazardous waste, but still are material that would not be recommended to, to permanently water through into the groundwater. There was nothing in the material, nothing in the information that was produced in the geotechnic work for the soil test data that we saw would indicate that that exists here. So there may be some asphalt materials in the fill, there may be some other building-related materials, et cetera. If there was anything that, that was flagged up to us, it would be something, even if they, if they did design systems, let's say they came back with some rain garden designs or some other material that um, designs that infiltrate upper strata of soil, um, that doesn't appear to be a risk on this particular site. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, think the town has quite a bit of salmon paint that we could use um, for the exterior of the building that you're talking about. Uh, right here. Yep. Thank you very much. <laughs> My name is Kevin Signetti, 13 Smith Avenue. Uh, I probably have more questions uh, than the night allows, so I'll try to keep it short. Kevin, you only have 10 minutes. Just a three, three minutes. <laughs> Just three minutes, I mean, like an egg. Uh, the first question is, there was a, uh, and again, I could be wrong, my hearing may be bad, but Chris, as well as Mr. Redfern, alluded to the fact that um, on uh, Block A, um, that there were two, 12 unit um, townhouse, uh, townhouses to be built there, built there. If that's true, that means 24 units. So I'd like to point the clarification out first. Chris? Sure. I'll, I'll, keep it, uh, I'll keep this up. I'll sit right next to you. There you go. That would be good. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, on the bottom of the plan, uh, we have. Um, Two 12 unit buildings, those are the ones that we were talking about. Right. The apartments and then the larger building out back. Now, the townhouses, uh, every one of those boxes over there is just one unit. So it's just 12 units. Okay, so they're just 12 total. Okay. okay. All right, that's the first question. The second question is Is there a provision for a lot C, D, or whatever in the future? The short sure answer is no. The proposal uh, that's before the zoning board of appeals uh, includes uh, two lots and developed in a way that we've shown the plan. I am not an engineer. My, my background's in finance. Based on the fact that uh, it appears as if uh, there is a proposal to build, I believe, uh, 84 units, I guess, 86 units. And the amount of time that you folks have spent, and effort that you've spent in putting this together, it doesn't appear as if um, the building will make very much money, if anything. So my question is, is there a provision in the future not to add a uh, lot C, D, E, or whatever, but to build either up or out on the existing lots, A or B? No. Uh, that would be a covenant and a condition that there be no further expansion uh, of what's shown on the approved plans. That will, so that will guarantee that nothing else is built. I, I think from what you're, first of all, I think from what you're telling me is um, 
that with your guarantee, express guarantee, not implied, and I'd like you to make a documentation on that, that there will be no further building other than the 86 units will be built on that property. That's correct. Okay. I'm done. Great, Kevin. Thank How you. About that? that was great. <laughs> I have a lot of work. Good question. Uh, Gene, back here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Tony DeRezzo, 130 John Street. I have a question about the sewer connection. Uh, on a normal subdivision, the applicant will build their own uh, private way, which if they build it correctly, the town will undertake. Here you have a unique situation where you have multiple lots, each with their own individual access to the right way. Uh, they will eventually be merged into two simple lots, which will change how much access each lot has. Uh, currently, the plan is to connect to a sewer that does not exist within the feeding soil of the island. Now, that sewer was not installed by the town. The town has no easements to it. And as the town has pointed out, any repairs is the financial responsibility of the residences which abut the existing sewer line. So, I'd like to know how the town plans on protecting the current residences from uh, the additional flow and the adjacent risks that that would have. It almost seems as though the town is, and the applicant are either assuming it's a public way or that the applicant actually owns the right way. Thank you. Chris? So part of our proposal, uh, if, if you're home as a chairman, is to uh, provide for uh, improvements to the uh, roadway that we know as uh, Lakeview Avenue. And uh, the understanding is that if those improvements are made, uh, the town uh, uh, has at least uh, you know, committed uh, you know, to the applicant to the best of their ability right now. It's something like that obviously have to go to a town meeting. Uh, that, uh, that such an improvement would allow us to, uh, to have the town uh, accept Lakeview Avenue as a public way. And so that's the premise that we're moving forward and built to the conditions and standards that the town has for yeah. public waste. Mm -hmm. correct. That's, that's correct. We've already had discussions with uh, DPW, uh, and uh, the plans are going to contain a, a detailed uh, cross-section uh, that they're going to show uh, to what standard uh, the expectation is for that construction. Thank you, Chris. Mr. Chairman, follow-up. Go ahead. According to the recent DRD meeting notes, the taking of the public way will happen after the buildings are built. Until that time, the applicant doesn't have a right to attach to the sewer. So how does the town and the applicant assume to get around this? There's something called the occupancy permit. And you can't get the occupancy permit until you've met all the standards in the conditions that were provided in the comprehensive permit, the 40B. So before any of the any of this is completed, um, the, the town's not going to wait until everything's done and hold up the the developer for, for giving a occupancy permit with, with the roadway to be brought up to standards. My guess is, and Gene or, or uh, somebody could could address that, but the ad attitude is that you work together to get this done so that you can give the occupancy permit so that you can start filling uh, the properties that you that you have there. Uh, and you, you're not going to do that because if I were buying one of those condos down there, um, that's the first question I would ask. Where, where's my guarantee? You're not going to sell any of those condos with nothing there in front of you. So, uh, Gene, do you want to Uh, yeah, that's true. The occupancy permit is very often the time when um, details uh, that we assume were being worked out uh, have the opportunity to get worked out. Um, and the uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't really classify this as a small detail. This is pretty significant, um, and I think you know the the town engineer and the applicant's engineer will be working very closely together so that this isn't something that gets missed along the way. Um, everyone has a definite built-in incentive to get it right. And uh, we asked 
that we have a six month advance notice of when we need to go and do the eminent domain taking. So um, if we're provided with that notice, and as I say, we're all working and growing in the same direction, we should be able to get that right. Thank you, Chief. And what happens if the town fails to take the right of way by eminent domain? Only town meeting take it, and we can't guarantee how they're going to vote. If the town meeting to agree to accept it as a public way, it would remain as a private way constructed in accordance with town standards. So that the, uh, the zoning board and the neighbors would be satisfied with that. It's to the to his detriment because then he would have the continuing responsibility of maintenance of the road if it didn't, if it wasn't accepted as a public way. But nevertheless, it would have been and will have been constructed in accordance with town standards. And what about the connection to the sewer that the applicant would not have access to? would be uh, connected to the sewer and that uh, permission will have been granted by the by the zoning board of appeals as part of the comprehensive permit but at this point in time the zoning board of appeals does not have the authority to grant private access or access to the applicant to a private entity it is not a town sewer there is no sewer I don't know what you mean by that. Yeah. The only Board of Appeals has the authority of town council to speak to this issue as part of its comprehensive permit to grant any and all permits that are necessary for the construction of a road, including a connection permit. Do I have that, Ted? Thank you. I'm going to ask town council, they're sitting right here tonight, so I'll ask him to come in. Sure, I believe that. I believe Ted is correct. Um, there are only, I think, a very few limited scenarios in which a town could deny a 40B applicant access to its public sewer. Uh, if there are title reasons why they can't connect, I'm not aware of them. But I, I, I have not yet detected any, any impediment to allowing the applicant to connect to the public sewer. Uh, wh whether the road uh, becomes public one day down the road or whether it remains private going in off going off in the future. Thank you, Chris. Last question for town council. This is this is town council right now he's already given his opinion. Um, I'll allow you one more and that's it. That's fine. Thank you. The question I have is what makes this sewer on private property or private road that the town did not install and does not have easements for a public sewer? If I understood what Chris said earlier, they're talking about running sewer lines from the project to the termination of the public sewer at the manhole in that exists within the private way so I, I would expect what they're doing and I'm no sewer engineer but that they're talking about running new sewer lines through the private way which they have rights to do um, and connecting it to the pub public sewer uh, where it currently exists is that fair a fair description of what you're proposing Chris so that's our proposal yes okay and if that I, I see no obstacle to them doing that Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions, Stephen? Name and location? Uh, David Cannon, 30 Beach Street. Uh, just a couple of uh, questions. In terms of the uh, electric utilities to all these units, I'm assuming that all the lines are underground, is that correct? I can speak without the microphone if I yell. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, 
the reason why I said that uh, most of these things that normally work out later, it, it's because RMLD takes a look at what the load requirements are going to be for these buildings, and they have to sort of design the transformers. And so it's a kind of a guess right now as to the size of the pads and that sort of thing. But to answer your question, uh, what I expect to see is this, there's a this overhead power that runs right down Lincoln Avenue. Mm -hmm. So my expectation will be that it'll be a drop connection from the pole underground to, to the a uh, transformer, and then everything from there will be underground. Right. Okay. Thank you. But they're in charge of that kind of stuff uh, sometimes. So that's your expectation. Our right, municipal light department is. Okay. Thank you. Um, and this might be a question for. Um, the uh, first engineer, um, could you go into a little detail about porous pavement? Um, say, like, could you give an explanation of how it works? Um, durability and maybe cost versus conventional pavement? I'm curious to know because this might be another environmental ad ad uh, advantage for the site. So I, can, I can give you a little, a little bit of detail about, about how it works. So the, the main difference between uh, porous asphalt and standard asphalt you see on roads and new driveways is that um, it's, it's constructed with an aggregate mix, a stone mix that, that is uh, lacking some of the finer particulates and some of the sand mix is a little bit less than regular asphalt. So when, it, when it sets up and it's compacted, there are very small, almost imperceptible voids that, that run through the pavement surface, which allow water to run through it, right? Of course, that's all. Um, the other component of it is a uh, filtration and storage layer um, beneath the, the porous surface. So if you can imagine regular roadway, uh, you have a pavement that's over a compacted gravel base, which is somewhat permeable, but doesn't allow a lot of water to run through quickly. Um, in porous asphalt, uh, underneath, immediately underneath the, the uh, porous layer is a, is a layer, of, uh, small crushed stone layer. It's called a choker layer. Um, that is, is, uh, structurally supports the asphalt, but also lets water run through it very quickly. Beneath that, there's usually, and this is the part that varies in size depending on how much, depending on how much water you want to store. There's a storage layer, which is larger crushed stone, which provides void space for water storage. So that's. That's kind of what the typical section looks like, and that can vary in depth, again, depending on how much water's in the pavement, what your storage needs are, et cetera. So, so structurally, in terms of the actual pavement section, um, pavement's about the same thickness. The stone layer, compared to a standard gravel base, is usually two, sometimes three times the depth. So that can create a cost disparity between standard pavement installation and porous asphalt. However, one of the benefits of porous installation is the stone storage layer. Um, and the fact that water doesn't run across the surface of it, it goes through it. So it eliminates aspects, the typical aspects, or, or at least reduces the extent of uh, a conventional stormwater collection and, and conveyance system. So there may not be a need for any basins, for example. Um, typically, on a project like this, you might include one in one of these parking lots as a, a safety measure, but generally speaking, no water will get to it. Um, uh, one thing that uh, would, would kind of, and I, I don't want to, I want to preface what I'm about to say about I'm not necessarily talking about this particular project, because I don't know the particulars of how that installation would affect these systems that are shown here. But in general, um, it can reduce or eliminate the need for structured stormwater storage under the under parking area. So, you know, hypothetically, it could substantially reduce the need for, for what's been included here for storage. But again, I'm saying that with, with the caveat that I'm, I can't comment quantitatively on those particular. That's the idea. So in terms of cost difference, there tends to be um, some kind of balance between those two costs. So the, the reduction in cost of conventional drainage system and the regular pavement versus the added cost for the additional stone and sub-base construction for porous asphalt. So is it, you know, how those balance up is usually the deciding factor whether it's appropriate for a site or not. The other factor that I, that I commented on earlier that 
would pertain to the tedious is if they had real high groundwater and the lava surface. That doesn't exist here, which is why we know it is in our comment letter that it could be feasible for this project. Does that answer your question? Or? Yes. I'll go on in the third grade. Just a follow up with the applicant be interested in exploring this as a possibility. So the, the, the short answer is, you know, we'll, we'll take a look at it because it was recommended, uh, but we always consider, you know, LID components when we're first um, doing our conceptual conceptual design and layout uh, to see, you know, can we incorporate something? Uh, sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. Uh, sometimes it's driven by uh, the client in some cases, uh, which it wasn't the case uh, on this project. It was more about uh, the fact that our site is relatively compact um, and, uh, and so you know, we approached the way we did. Uh, you know, it works and it complies with the regulations. Uh, so that's, that's what we've done. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Are there any additional questions? Not seeing any. Um, I'll close the public access to the meeting uh, for this evening. Um, and uh, I'd like to see what we have for dates so that we can move forward on this. I think we have just one date right now. I believe it's uh, the 5th of December. Is that correct, Andrew? Yes. So in my opinion, I'd like to leave that open for the regular applications that we received due to the schedule that they're already on. Um, but I'll leave that up to you guys to decide. Uh, we have a full set of um, hearing on the 7th of uh, December coming up now. November. I mean, sorry, I'm sorry, November. Um, the rest of the month is pretty much closed off because of town meeting and other... Right, town meeting is held on Thursdays in November, so we could look at a Wednesday date, the 14th and 28th of the days before town meeting. I don't know if we're open to that or not, um, but if everyone's available, we could pretend to do those dates as well. Sure. We think town meeting is only going to be one night this year, um, and that's November 15th. So, fingers crossed, that's what we're planning for. Which would mean if we were to start it off on the 14th, leaving the 5th open for um, regular well, we have to we have to get a day certain for an extension of uh, the continuation of, of, of the 40B. Right. Um, we can't. How many how many uh, dates do we have allocated for town meeting? Should this run run longer? If town meeting is not completed in one night, it will reconvene on Monday, November 19th. That's and the Monday before Thanksgiving. And we certainly are not going to probably have a meeting the day before Thanksgiving. I wouldn't recommend it. Which is? <laughs> the 18th. 18th is Thanksgiving? No, the 20th. No, the 21st. 21st. 21st is we do the Wednesday. Yeah, no. we could do that. Yeah. The day before Thanksgiving? That's when a lot of people traveling. So. Oh, yeah. Well, I, no, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't yeah. recommend that. That's why I was recommending the 14th or the 28th. Right. Uh, November. Yes. yes. November. I don't know if Ted. Uh, He's talking, they're talking new plans, so they mean I know. time. Yeah. Yep. From our point of view, uh, Mr. Chairman, I noticed that December 5th was an available date. That, in my opinion, would give us enough time for Chris to work with Matt to get all of these things done. And also, as I had suggested earlier, to address the concerns of, of all the department heads so that we could come to you with, with a pretty much a, a completed plan that you could then look at and make comment on. So I think December 5th, from our point of view, would give us the necessary time. 
to have to I don't see the fifth year. Andrew, what do we have in the... Um, so we have a few applications already coming. Um, oh, that haven't, but haven't been accepted yet. That haven't been accepted yet. So. And with a two-week uh, notification for publication, that would put them potentially on the 5th. If we were to do that, after the 5th of December, where are we? There's no other scheduled hearing dates, but the 12th and 19th could be available for either 40B hearing or we could make it work with the other 12th and the 4th. Uh, the 12th of December would be open? Mm -hmm. Ted, how was the 12th of December? That, that, that would work. Give you an extra week. Give you an extra week, yeah. That would work. Mm -hmm. That's what I would recommend. And we can keep our schedule. Okay. G? Um, the only issue as we get into December is we have scheduled uh, budget hearings, and uh, the 12th is one of those. <laughs> uh, we're meeting the 4th and 5th, the 11th and the 12th of December. How about, how about the 5th of December? Is that open? Just well, the 4th and the 5th. We could flip flop. No, right now, we, we, we have a hold on the calendar for the 4th and the 5th, the 5th, 11th and the 12th. Um, I don't know exactly what's going to happen on which nights. Yeah. Um, Where are your budget meetings? Um, I don't even know if that's been scheduled. Typically, we have them in the um, selectmen's meeting room, in the uh, conference room, conference. in the town hall. I think um, that's typically that years we've been here, so it's hard to say. Well, uh, the other option uh, Bob just suggested is what if we looked at the fifth for the 40B and leave our <coughs> leave any open meetings that we're hearings that would be coming up uh, from the regular uh, population um, on the 12th. It's doable. If I have to be up at town hall for an hour to do budgets and down here or at the library or wherever, I can I can. Well, the fifth on the fifth. Fifth now we would have the forty B. Yeah. On the twelfth we would have our regular hearings. Right, but right now on my calendar I'm booked with budgets on the fifth. Oh. But that's okay. I can <laughs> I can do both. Yeah, and Andrew will be here, so um, it's manageable. Well. Um, if you're out both of those, um, the heavier me is going to be, the, I would assume, the 5th, 4th and the 5th. You may not get all the way to the 11th and the 12th. It's hard to say. Mm -hmm. I think it's tough. But I can ask to go first so that they can do me first and then I'm available to the zoning board. That for, be, which, for which? That would be on, um, and, and this is just what I could ask, is to have December 4th, the first night of the budgets. For yourself. If, oh. if my department can go first, then whether you meet that night or not, I'll, I'll be done within the first hour, and I can come join you guys later. On the 5th? The 4th, the 5th, whatever, whatever. But I can, I can make it work around mm. whatever. Can we get a meeting place on the 12th for the regular hearings? And I would suggest that if we're doing this either way, that we hold the 40B on us to keep our regular schedule going if she has budget meetings yeah. both weeks anyways. I can make it work, so don't worry yeah. about what, what my commitments are. Okay, I know meetings. you want to get Why this done. Why do we keep it the 5th and the 12th for yeah. the 40B? The, the 40B would be then on the uh, 12th. Yep. Yeah. And the regular hearings that we have are scheduled for the fifth. Okay. The twelfth is, is still a, a budget night, just so we're clear. Right, exactly. Yes. So, but if I can get done early, then mm -hmm. then I'm free. Um, I know there's been a, a lot of information or, or requests for hearings coming up, and I know they're all in the wings. Um, we still have to address those also. If I could just say, um, getting the plans early enough so that everyone has had time to review them is, is, is critical. critical. Critical, critical, critical. 
we understand that. Okay. Um, we also said that um, in the peer review that uh, should there changes be made, uh, we may have to go to a peer review individual um, for some of these also. Would that, I'd have to ask Matt if he would be available then to review within a week's time and be back here on the 12th. Yeah, the longest lead time for us doing these kinds of reviews is the initial review to understand what the project is and yeah. the follow-ups are fairly important. Okay. Then um, I'll check the motion to continue the subject matter of this 40B, I like view, um, Eaton Street. Before, okay. All right, go Sox, right? But I do have, I'm going to leave you with one more thought. I'm going to the one that's been sitting here. Not that I'm opposed to it, because it does, it does have applications, but the unlikely scenario, let's say, where a car, a car would be damaged or where it leak fluids, um, you know, perfect, having an imperfect service can serve a purpose. I and mean, our deep sunk catch basins are fitted with an oil and gas trap, first line of defense. Our oil and gas separation device, which is a separate structure, also separates oil and, uh, and sediment. Before going to the final filtration device, you know, those things are unlikely, but you can envision what would happen. You know, you don't really have a good opportunity to prevent mm. something from entering the ground you know, almost immediately um, in a spill situation. You know, I don't know, I mean, it's an apartment project. I don't know, what are the chances of that happening? Uh, I guess it depends on people's vehicles and, and that sort of thing, but just something to think about. Okay. Yeah, the, the the other aspect too, I don't know if what CONCOM is going to require and what your thoughts are on uh, salting of the parking lots in the winter too. And uh, obviously if you do that, you're introducing salts uh, to the groundwater with the uh, porous pavements, you know. Yeah. Yeah. One of the nice things is that you don't have to use as much right. salt. Right. Um, if you're not uh, considered testing. Yeah. It does. It, yeah, that's that's my experience. It was it's not real durable, but yet it parking lot should have a lot of traffic either on it. Uh, I say one other thing. Uh, now that we, we are at a point uh, where we're uh, close to finalizing plans, I suggest to Chris that he file with the Conservation Commission now so you'll be able to hear from them you know, before you make a final decision. And I know we can't dictate to the Conservation Commission, but one of the things I, I'm going to suggest uh, is perhaps if communication can be made, perhaps by Andrew, to the commission that, uh, to have Matt uh, as the reviewer for the Conservation Commission, because I hate to see another engineer introduced to it, so now we have possibly two engineers on stormwater. So I know we can't tell the Conservation Commission what to do, but if that polite suggestion could be made mm -hmm. that we could use Matt, it would, it would coordinate the whole project. Right. I think that's why we originally had him going to CONCOM, that you guys asked us to take that out of the scope of work. So, Thank I think you. that's doable. Okay. Well, those are, that's not getting to the, the question. So I'll accept the motion to move the subject matter of this hearing to the 12th. December 12th. Oh, can I just ask one clarifying? Um, I just want to make sure I understand. This concludes the peer review portion for the board, correct? We're, we're essentially done with peer review. I mean, Matt's going to continue. But as far as anything else related to peer review, there's nothing else on the to-do list, correct? I don't think so. Okay. Unless somebody else has. No. Okay. okay. Thank you. So I'll still accept the motion. <laughs> so move that uh, the meeting continue to uh, December 12th. Okay. Uh, location to be announced. Um, do I have a second? Second. 
someplace I can get my roll of dice. Stop. Stop. Hold it. Hold it. I think we should continue um, to be there. Are there any discussion? It's on the motion. We have a first. We have a second. And a second. All in favor? Okay. We haven't concluded the subject matter of this hearing yet for the board. Uh, all we've done is set a time and a date for the next con continued meeting. So, unless the board has any other business before us this evening. Okay, I don't think so. No? Oh, except now a motion. Motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second? Second. All in favor? All right. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.